Israel has been moving uh, right uh, for the past 25 years. The uh, onslaught of terrorism, the first and second Palestinian uprisings, the intifadas, have basically decimated the peace camp in Israel and left many people persuaded that uh, it's not peace is not possible. October 7th, the horrific Hamas massacre, I think, uh, has been the final nail in that coffin. And so you have an Israeli public that's not only traumatized, but persuaded that uh, there's no peace on the horizon. So where does that leave us, Professor? Here we're, we're several months into this conflict. And from, you know, from this vantage point here in the States, it just doesn't look like there's any real solution here. Can you walk us through what could be some scenarios here? Sure. Uh, look, the, if there's a hope that uh, change will come from the region, I think that's not going to be fulfilled. You don't have the leadership either in Israel, among Palestinians, or in the Arab world that would uh, take this and run towards uh, a more peaceful outcome, which puts the onus very much on the United States and other outside parties. Of course, we're in an election year, makes it challenging politically for the president to consider uh, a major initiative, but without a strong U.S. push, uh, not only to rebuild Gaza and to provide some hope for the millions of people who've been displaced, but also to try to get the peace process back on track without a U.S. push, uh, we're going to be fated to have this kind of uh, ongoing violence for years to come. So give us a sense, Professor, the position of uh, Mr. Netanyahu in Israel in this whole conflict. We know prior to October 7th, there were serious challenges to uh, his position. Where are we now? What kind of role will he play over the coming months and then maybe even beyond? Well, October 7th changed his political fortunes to a great degree, even though uh, the opposition before that time had been uh, arguing against his ideas for judicial reform. Uh, he was pretty firmly in power with a right wing coalition. Uh, right now, however, his polling numbers are have tanked. He's somewhere around 10, 12 percent. Right. And the assumption and the assumption is that there's there's an election. He's not going to return. But it's not easy to get rid of a prime minister if that coalition hangs yep. together. And well, so uh, you have a situation where a prime minister right. is uh, governing without support. In the precious time we have left with you, Ambassador, and, you know, again, I, Paul, I can't say enough about someone with roadworthy experience of Cairo yes. and Tel Aviv and Jerusalem as well. But, Ambassador, I want to turn to the protests in America, and I want to take it to your Columbia uh, University, and it may be Students for Justice in Palestine. It may be, in December, Columbia suspended pro-Palestine student groups. Ambassador, with your service to Egypt and your knowledge of the Arab world, I want you to speak to the kids who are pro-Palestine. What would you say to them? You know, the hardest thing for those of us who have served in government, but also for those of us in the private sector, is to have two contradictory ideas in our mind at the same time. You know, what happened to Israel on October 7th was unimaginable. And what's happening in Gaza since is unimaginable. And so, you know, to, to take one side or another really doesn't help resolve this issue. And the argument I've made is on, on Princeton's campus, where I now teach, or at Columbia, where I did my, my studies, is we've got to talk to each other about this. It doesn't mean that you can't be a partisan. It doesn't mean that you can't right. advocate for change, but we've got to start talking to each other. To our two presumptive candidates, can President Trump and President Biden talk to each other? Doesn't look like it. Uh, they've adopted so many uh, positions in contrast to each other, and now they're, yeah. they're moving further away in this era of uh, highly partisan politics, both domestically and in foreign policy.